Hey everyone, it is the Monday, December 13th version of Lunch with Lincoln, and we start right now. Hey everybody, welcome back. I am your host for today, Reed Galen, co-founder of The Lincoln Project. My guest today is Professor Jay Van Bavel. He is an associate professor at New York University of Psychology and Neural uh, Science. I had to write that down, Jay, because I always forget. (laughs) Um, Want to thank you for joining me today. So Jay, you and some of your colleagues recently put out a paper, I believe as of today, uh, explaining the language that Donald Trump used uh, on the uh, mall, the National Mall on January 6th, and how he utilized that language to achieve an end result. Uh, So take us a little bit through what you and your colleagues saw and give us some examples of of what you're talking about. Sure, Uh, so we have a new paper and it's a preprint, which means we just submitted it for review at a journal and it it combines the expertise of 10 academics who study leadership and groups and followership. And what we fundamentally point out in our paper after analyzing the language of Trump, as well as uh, dozens of his followers who uh, were involved in the insurrection on January 6th, is two two key elements of the insurrection. The first is that Trump used a framework of what we call identity leadership. So he created a sense of us, shared identity, um, and made people feel victimized, that they were being victimized, their rights were being taken away. And when that happens, it helps rationalize and justify Uh, their willingness to engage in things that are legal or harmful to others because they think it's in the service of something better or bigger, more important, which is preserving their rights. Um, And then the second piece of it is really his followers, that Trump is different from some leaders and that what he does is he kind of frames a broad goal that his followers understand, but he doesn't ever really give them explicit instructions about what to do. Um, And so they creatively find solutions and ways of acting that move towards his goal to please him. Well, and I think also, and we've seen this with with bad actors throughout history, which is um, because people like Trump have so broken down the norms of behavior, not only generally, but specifically within their, within their follower base, that there's sort of no guardrails to what they might do, right? Yeah. That, like, so there's no like, well, that's the goal, and the way to do that fastest and most effectively would be to do that. But we can't do that because that's not OK. There's no such thing as, quote, not OK. Right. Yeah. This is one of the reasons why norms matter so much in a democracy is they provide boundaries and guardrails about what is appropriate behavior or not. And Trump has this way of like skirting well past the norms of the guardrails and right up to the edge of illegal behavior and uh, signaling that that's appropriate for his followers, who many of them are deeply identified with him. Many of them are more identified with Trump himself than his political party. So when you have that kind of loyalty and attachment, it provides a framework for people to look to him to figure out what to do. Well, you know, that's that's the interesting part, just as an aside on the party front, because um, last week um, on our podcast, I had Ruth Ben-Ghiat, who's uh, another academic who's been studying authoritarianism for a very long time. And one thing that, Jay, she said that I thought was really interesting and I hadn't put together was that uh, Trump has provided this sort of umbrella for all of these disparate groups to, to sort of reside underneath with a, almost with a patina of legitimacy, right, um, that they never otherwise would have had. Mm-hmm. But many of them are not Republicans. Many of them are, are, are either apolitical or almost anarchical in, in their beliefs, right? They don't, they don't like any system, right, let alone, yeah. you know, they're not like, Oh yeah, you know, as a Republican, I believe in limited government and freedom of expression and and a muscular and moral foreign policy, right? They're like, I don't like anything. Yeah, and there's a number of people that I saw one analysis suggesting that there's a certain segment of the population who will gravitate towards and vote for the leader that they think a embodies certain anti-democratic principles, mm-hmm. including like a you know, uh, you know, uh, racism or sexism, but also certain types of leadership, authoritarian leadership style, that they're not going to fit by the normal mold of what we expect out of a political leader. And so those people swung to Trump in 2016 and provided a big part of his base. Um, The other part of it that you can really see in the January 6th insurrection is it feels like the internet had come to life. When you look at the people, 
they're not actually like a well-organized militia. They're not even really wearing the same things. They're wearing different symbols of subgroups that have all coalesced under their uh, allegiance to Trump. And some of the people were dressed up, you know, completely absurd. Right. And so it, it felt to, I think man, I remember seeing it on Twitter and the like first the guy wave with of, the horns. Yeah. The first wave of response was like in the media and on social media was like, this is, this is weird and insane and funny. And, and because it brought together people who are not normally part of these types of political movements. And you're right. He did give them a home and a shared sense of purpose, identity, and value. So before we get to some of the specific language that you all outline in your paper, I mean, that was the one thing, you know, is, is, you know, the people who stormed the Capitol almost a year ago, these were not, most of these people were not economically disadvantaged, right? Yeah. They weren't people yeah. who live, you know, in the, you know, dying coal towns of Eastern Kentucky or West Virginia or Southern Ohio. These are folks who were able to make their way to Washington, D.C. They were able to find places to stay. Some people came on private jets. Some mm -hmm. were willing, you know, were able to buy thousands of dollars worth of tactical gear. Um, you know, and so you're right. I, I do think that it was it was the Internet come to life. My question is, um, you know, do you believe psychologically, though, that what what some of those people who maybe were cheering on from their Facebook accounts on that day, now that they see these people, um, you know, being hauled before federal judges and being put in prison? Look, I, I don't I've never been to federal prison. And I don't want to go. But my guess is four months in a federal joint, not a great experience, even if it doesn't seem like a long time. Do you think that has any you know, um, effect on people who are otherwise keyboard cowboys, but might want to actually cross into the analog world? Does it, does it serve as a deterrent or not? Yeah. I mean, that's part of what the legal system is supposed to do is signal that this is inappropriate and it did cross a line and that we as a country do have legal standards. We're a country of laws. Right. So, so hopefully it does have a deterrent value. Um, I, I don't know if it will change things for those keyboard, for some of those keyboard warriors, but I remember reading the quotations and, and testimonials of some of these people who were, you know, arrested and then charged, and some of them have been convicted, is that they felt betrayed. They felt like Trump had their back when they did this, and it was going to be okay, and that it was legal because he was kind of egging them on and signaling that this was an appropriate thing to do. So there, even among the people who were arrested, there's, the, for among many of them, a, a seemingly sense of betrayal about how it unfolded that they weren't expecting. So let's go back 330 days to that to that morning on the on the National Mall in Washington D.C. Um, give us some examples of the kind of language that that Donald Trump used that day and the and the sort of mo either motivating effect or um, the effect of giving people permission to do what they ultimately ended up doing. Okay, so one of the things that we analyzed in his speech was the amount of collective pronouns he used. So words like we or us. Um, you know, people think of Trump as, as a narcissist who's all focused on himself. But if you look at his rhetoric, he used a collective pronoun 340 times in mm. his speech. And so that's once, I think it was about every 30 words. Mm -hmm. And when we looked, uh, there, one of our co-authors on this paper had analyzed every single Australian political leader for many decades and found that the, the people who won elections were very likely to use these collective pronouns, they mobilize people, make them feel like they're part of a group. Um, but they do it about once every 80 words. <laughs> so Trump was really off the charts in the way he was framing this as us, as we're all together in this. Um, the other thing that was different about his rhetoric in his speech was that he was using the word they a lot. So it wasn't just that there was an us, but he was also villainizing and demonizing people who uh, he framed as against him in a way that right. also was pretty off the chart. So he framed it as if him and his, his supporters were victims of what he called, for example, radical left Democrats. Or the, the, fake. Or the, the big lie, the steal, right? Yeah, we had to yeah. stop the steal. Yeah, he was pushing the big lie. He said it was stolen also by the fake news media. And so he was really framing it as we are the good guys. And there are these evil uh, agents set against us who have power, who are radicals, who are spreading misinformation. And we have to do something about it or we're going to lose democracy. And so that was like, you can code, you can see these in terms of the specific words he used. You can code them quantitatively and compare them to other leaders. And when he's using these, these are, as I said, he's a real outlier in the way he was using this language compared to other leaders. So let me ask you this. I mean, you are, you are uh, an expert in neural science and psychology. D does Trump go into this with a plan or is it just instinct? Is it all instinct? 
Yeah, I mean, it's hard to tell with Trump. I, I get the sense that he has a broad plan about he wants to overturn the election and, and retain power. Um, but it seems like how he's doing it is that he's making up kind of the speech as he goes. It seems like he, and this is one of the reasons I think his followers have always found Trump authentic, is right. that he doesn't seem like he's reading from a script that his speechwriter wrote. It seems authentically coming from Trump's brain. And so people feel like they have a closer one-on-one -on -one connection with him than they probably would with a normal political leader who's who has a speechwriter and is very careful in how they're framing it. And it feels a little bit more contrived. Well, it, well, it, it is by definition contrived. I mean, you even go back, to, if you looked at his time in office, um, then President Trump, when he was reading off a teleprompter, when he was forced to read off a teleprompter, you could see his level of discomfort with being stuck to that script. Literally, like you could tell he didn't like doing it. Um, because, and, and then even you would see that you know he would ad lib in the middle of it, even if it had nothing to do with the, the, the rest of the copy. Right. Yeah. It had nothing to do with whatever he was talking about. Um, you know, it will always be like very good or very bad, you know, like all that stuff because he, he felt like, OK, I this is not me. I have to put some of myself in it. Um, but I think also, you know, there were times to your point about this sort of let it be done sort of attitude that he, he has expressed. You mentioned before we went on the air that Michael Cohen said that that's how he ran the Trump organization, which was he didn't say go do this and do it this way and do it that way and call this guy and do this. He said, I want that done or we should get, we should take care of that. Yeah. And the strategy of that is, first of all, it doesn't require him to micromanage the people that are under him. Um, but the other one is it provides a lie or sorry, a plausible deniability, which is essentially what happened, you know, part of the case he made when he was being impeached. Part of the case right now is that he's able to try to frame it as, you know, even though this happened, he had no responsibility for it, that these were a bunch of individuals acting on their own and that he just simply wanted them to like go protest or something like that. And so this is like, he kind of skates that fine line between telling people exactly what to do, which w would provide one way of behaving, but also would, would uh, implicate him versus another strategy, which is kind of outlining a goal and how they're working together towards this goal, but never saying exactly what to do. And it's really powerful for mobilizing groups of people to do something, but never kind of bearing the responsibility himself. Well, and we saw that last year too um, in places like Portland, Oregon, where, you know, there had been, you know, it, it was a relatively small part of, you know, maybe like a one, two square block area of downtown, but there were sort of nightly skirmishes and Trump said, I don't like that. It should stop. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, or we should do something about that. We should, you know, we should show those guys who's in charge. And what happens, right? Then Chad Wolf, acting Secretary of Homeland Security, you know, sends in, in a bunch of federal DHS federal officers um, who, and, and, and you know, immediately get into a fight with everybody, right? Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, those also were the images that Trump instinctually wanted and believed he needed to be successful, which was, you know, um, those people are running amok, right? Remember when the looting sh starts, the shooting starts, yeah. um, you know, to your point, even, you know, if you look at a young man like Kyle Rittenhouse, um, you know, he had been to these rallies of Trump, right? He had spent yeah. a lot of time in these places. Um, you know, he crossed a state border and he did what he thought was necessary and what, what was acceptable. And then uh, apparently a, a court of law agreed. Um, so, you know, they, they, there are real world consequences uh, to his sort of musings. Um, but it was also interesting just watching him over the years is that his musings change minute by minute. So it's almost impossible to keep up with him. Yeah. And, and I think the other thing Trump did very well, um, it was use social media to amplify people he thought were working well in his, towards his goals. Right. And so I remember reading one analysis at one point, he had retweeted like a thousand conspiracy theorists. And these were like random people showing up in his mentions. Right. And he immediately can amplify them to 90 million people and get them on the five o'clock news in a way that they never would have been amplified ever before. And what it signals is that he has a direct connection with his followers and will uh, reward in, in the most prominent way possible those who are creatively doing things uh, that make him look good and help him achieve his goals. But he also, you know, the flip side of that, too, though, is that he, he is not afraid to, you know, call out publicly yeah. um, those that disagree with him or do things he doesn't like. Yeah, including his own uh, members of his own cabinet, members of the Republican Senate, members of Congress. His vice president. 
his vice president. I mean, yeah, can you imagine a more prominent person to to put in the you know the target of this group of people, the mob that he had fomented? So yeah, so he was a master of doing that, and so a lot of people ran ran around trying to make him happy out of fear that he would, you know, kind of sick his followers on them in various ways. Well, and I mean, we see that too with. I mean, and this is where, you know, that, that, that threat, right? Um, you see it, I think you saw it with like Facebook, right? Like Facebook could have and should have taken a harder line on this kind of language and these kinds of groups and individuals and the stuff they were spreading, but they were afraid of the right-wing mob, right? They were afraid of maybe a Trump bashing them. And so, you know, they, they opened the door to, you know, to the, the hellscape that is, you know, the alt-right conservative, you know, cyberspace, and it's there today. I think also you see that with the mainstream media today, which is, you know, when the right-wing outrage machine gets spinning, the mainstream media and the left do one of two things. They either run for cover or they amplify the right-wing outrage by, you know, by saying, you know, whoever it is that they're attacking, they attack too because they want to make sure that they're not subject to the right wing mob where the, the 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 correct choice at least in my mind is you stand to thwart you know history and say this is bullshit don't do this this is not <laughs> this is not right um but you know that fear whether or not it's from the individual troll or from Donald Trump is real and it has again real world effects on this stuff yeah so you kind of have multiple multiple consequences one is that you might have individual people threatening you or finding your home. So this happened to a lot of election election officials when he was, you know, perpetuating this notion of election fraud. A lot and of people are, with school board members yeah, now too. And you're seeing with school board members and no one wants to be a public servant making almost no money facing death threats or people like showing up at their doorstep with their family. Um, and then the other threat is economic. And so an example of this you can take completely out of politics was the NFL. Mm -hmm. When he started criticizing the NFL, you could see that Republicans uh, approval ratings of the NFL plummeted after he started tweeting about them when they when they refused to step in when players were kneeling, or, you know, after Colin Kaepernick was kneeling. And so the the potential one of the hugest elements of the core audience of NFL fans uh, was talking about boycotting going to the games and not buying tickets and turning off the TV. And so when you can mobilize such a large group of citizens to opt out of these types of economic arrangements um, or individuals to threaten, you know, public figures. Um, it, that's a really powerful uh, capacity that you have. And he was really skilled uh, at wielding that at all times for all kinds of transgressions from the smallest transgression of a, you know, of a TV host saying something they didn't like about him to massive organizations like the NFL that are, you know, normally cross cutting and bipartisan and, in the allegiance of fans that they have. So let me, let me ask a couple questions. One is the first, uh, it's, it's a two part question. The first is, does this rely solely on Donald Trump or can it exist without him? Yeah. I mean, I think that it's a little bit of both. So Trump built up these followers. And as I said, there's some studies that suggest support for Trump among his followers. They supported him more than the GOP. And you could see that by, some of them going and talking about hanging Mike Pence at the Capitol. So that was or like how easy how easy it was yeah. to, for Roger Stone to say like David Perdue and Kelly Loeffler in Georgia last December and January weren't Trumpy enough. Yeah. Therefore, you should stay home and Republicans stayed home. Yeah. Yeah. So that has all kinds of consequences when you have that type of individual level loyalty for the leader. Um, the other thing that is part of it, of course, is that now that he's fostered this culture, you're seeing all these imitators in the Republican Party. That was going to be my next question. Yeah. yeah, go for it, please. From Ron DeSantis to like Matt Gates, um, and so you really do have this kind of growth of people who realize this is a core part of the base. Now, there's like a certain num um, type of language and messaging that appeals to them, and that wielding them is a uh, enormously politically powerful. And they're obviously many of them are trying to ride it to political success or economic success. Well, well, and I think they see that as both at this point. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, and so that was going to be my second question, which was, um, let's, for argument's sake, say that Trump decides not to run for president in 2024, which I don't think is going to happen. I, I yeah. think I told you I, I could see him announcing next year just because the world will be pointed away from him. And he, that's the least, you know, he hates that. And, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, it's it's a good, you know, potential bar to prosecution. But you bring up like a Ron DeSantis. Um 
Ron DeSantis has been very good. Um, and I mean this like he has been very good at sort of mimicking the Trumpism, yeah. right? While still, you know, seeming to at least a lot of Republicans I know to be relatively speaking normal, right? Um, Gates does not have that. Like he's super Trumpy, but no one thinks that guy's normal. Uh, <laughs> and I, on my pa- podcast that'll drop uh, this week, we had uh, Abigail Tracy from Vanity Fair um, on, and she said she'd spent some time with Gates and like Gates knows it's an act. Yeah. Right. But he's perfectly willing to go along with it. And then I think you have like the Marjorie Taylor Greens who actually believe this stuff and the Paul Gosars who actually believe this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's this weird sort of spectrum of people. But I guess my question would be, um, you know, d- does it do do the does the umbrella do people stay under the umbrella of this, the you know, of this language? Because that's what we're talking about here. Uh, if it doesn't have that, that, you know, the tent pole or the, I'm going to mix all my metaphors here of a Donald Trump who's holding it all up. Yeah. I think that that's part of it. So this is, I, I'm reading a book right now called cultish, which is about the language of fanaticism. Mm-hmm. And it's also something we talk a lot about in, in my recent book, the power of us is, is language. And I think insofar as this group of voters exists, they've been conditioned to think through a certain language, mm-hmm. just like certain cults are. And so that language and that rhetoric and those symbols of identity can be leveraged by other individuals. Of course, it's, I think it's impossible. And my guess, you know, if I were to bet money on it, it would be, it'd be impossible to beat Trump in the Republican primary running as, you know, Trump light. Um, right. But if he's not in, then I think like that probably is a really potent strategy. And one of the ways to do it is use the symbols and the rhetoric that, that signals that you align with Trump in enough ways that his followers will hear that and, and r- realize that you're talking to them. It's, it's its own form of dog whistle, essentially. It's dog whistling that I'm an insider in this group or this community. And so that's part of, of his power is that he's built a community and that they're loyal to him. But if other people can signal they have that loyalty, um, then they can tap into it. And I would say this is one of the reasons why you might see dynamics of, you know, a lot of these Republicans who are thinking about running in the, in the next primary right. are not really coming out against Trump just yet. I think what most of them are hoping is that Trump will step will will step out of it and that they'll be able to jump in and get his uh, approval and capture his base using his rhetoric. And so there's huge incentives for for those people, those potential leaders to uh, reframe themselves as the next generation of, of Donald Trump. Well, I mean, look, we're seeing a preview of that now, um, whether or not it's in U.S., whether or not it's in local races. Um, right, which are now becoming more polarized, whether or not it's yeah. a school board race or a city council race or whatever it is. Um, we're seeing it in you know federal races in the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate and then gubernatorial races and other statewide races um, because they all want that approval, right? You see Josh Mandel, who's gone totally off the deep end uh, with his craziness in the Ohio Senate primary. And you see J.D. Vance, who's, you know, who started yeah. anti-Trump in 2016 and is trying to move cautiously towards the Trumpy yeah. line, but doesn't want to cross over because he's smart enough to know, like, you go Mandel, you probably lose a general election. But then the other side, too, is, you know, Donald Trump's been an asshole in the public sphere for like 50 years, right? <laughs> so, like, th- no one is surprised by what he says or what he does because that's who he's been. And frankly, it was the, yeah. it was the personality he cultivated. But then you saw, like, a, a couple of weeks ago in the United States Senate primary in Pennsylvania, where a guy named Sean Parnell dropped out because after uh, you know he, he he lost custody of his kids because there was a an allegation by his ex wife that he'd been abusive, he couldn't survive it. Right, the people in the you know even though he had been he was Trump's choice, Parnell wasn't going to survive a Republican primary because all of the donors and everybody else who'd coalesced behind him said, "You're no, you can't do this." Now, of course, he's been replaced by Doctor Oz, which probably has its own <laughs> linguistic. Um, you know, linguistic background that you guys could probably write a paper on. But, you know, Oz today was um, was saying that, um, you know, he was on Fox News this morning saying that he was offended and he was being canceled by the Philadelphia Inquirer because they were not going to refer to him in their coverage as Dr. Oz, but as (laughs) Mehmet Oz. And he somehow took that as like this affront, which, of course, is because no one will know who the hell Mehmet Oz is. Right. It's his brand, um, yeah. They won't. They maybe they will think he's Turkish or whatever it is, and he understands the you know the primary in which he's dealing with, um, especially in a state like Pennsylvania. 
Um, so, you know, this, this, ling this linguistic aspect of things, uh, you know, has, the, has, you know it, it has all these tendrils that run out into the country well past Donald Trump. Yeah, I mean, th these are a bunch of candidates trying to figure out where the base is and how they can activate it in a way that they can kind of replicate Trump. Um, so there's going to be a lot of decision making by those people. Uh, J.D. Vance is, I think, the most interesting case where he's slowly going more and more Trumpish because he's somebody who it seems like he has his finger up to the wind and realizes that what it's, it's going to take for him to meet his political aspirations. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's also possible that if like someone else breaks through and wins because there's like a glut of 10 candidates running on a Trump light platform, that maybe that could, would split the vote enough that, you know, someone who's like more a traditional Republican, like a Jeb Bush style leader might be able to break through. And then that could reset, you know, everything going forward. That becomes the new norm of what it takes to, let, to win the Republican primary again. So well, this but is that, like, but that's the thing, know. too, is going back to Georgia last year. Right. Which yeah. is. Um, you know, do those people, to your point, let's say that enough, let's say that just in a, in a, in a, in a fictional primary, there are 10 candidates and eight of them are going full Trump. Yeah. And then there's like, there's the Glenn Youngkin and then somebody else. Right. Yeah. And the Youngkin is able to sort of spend money, spend money, spend money. And the rest of these people, you know, and he, you know, crosses, you know, he crosses into the general. Um, now Youngkin ran an extremely disciplined campaign. Right. It, as much as Trump wanted to get involved in there, like they were able to keep Trump out of it. Um, and, and education was the broader issue in that race. But that's but the point I'm going with here is that if you're not if you're not willing to give enough, even in, in a primary that you win without Trump's help, if you're not willing to give enough of a nod to him and yeah. sort of his belief system, then you could have them saying, well, he's just another Mitch McConnell rhino. Right. Is yeah. that what we need? in the US Senate because they're ultimately nihilists, right? It's not about the party. They don't care about the Republican party or Republican ideals, they don't have any. So it's really just about like the power and the aggrandizement and the, and the wealth. Um, and so that's, that's, the, that's the hard part for an otherwise, you know, you know, old line Republican, as many of them as there are, uh, that you, know, it's, it's, you have to go and hold your base because the base isn't impressed. Yeah, I think the, my understanding of it is that Trump maintains a lot of power as long as a significant number of, of the base identify more with him than the party. Right. And then he gets to be a kingmaker and choose who he, who he blasts or who he, you know, uh, anoints as, as the person that is following in his footsteps. And so that's going to create, as long as that exists, then there, that's always going to create a pressure for candidates to kind of suck up to him and curry favor with him and cut, cut deals with him. Um, to ensure that he anoints them. And so until that subgroup of people loses their identification with Trump and identifies back with the party in general, then you're going to forever have a dynamic that looks like that. So that's one of the challenges is like, how do leaders navigate that identity? And, and as long as he's there, that will forever be a threat to democracy. Um, and he could carry that, that following with him for a long time, you know, potentially past the next election. Right. And well, and again, he doesn't care about democracy. Yeah. Right. I mean, I still believe to this day that he didn't expect he was going to win in 2016. This was all just going to be a brilliant marketing play. Yeah. Um, but then he's like, oh, wait, I'm in power. Maybe I could figure out how to stay in power. Yeah. Um, and, and now here we are. I mean, and, and just to close on that, which is, you know, as, as we now see all these documents and all these other things coming, coming to, to light, um, you know, these PowerPoints that Mark Meadows has put in, which is, you know, I think it goes back to your point, which is he never said, create a PowerPoint. He yeah. never said, John Eastman, come up with how I do this. He said, they stole it from me. Figure it out. Yeah, exactly. And he had all kinds of people under him working creatively, smart people around the clock to figure out a loophole for him to sustain power. And I will say this, Jay, as someone who is now a vestigial Republican, the number of people that I know personally who not only helped, but continue to help him do that to this day uh, is beyond heartbreaking and and frustrating and angering um, because these are people who absolutely know better and have sacrificed everything on this guy's altar for their own, what they believe to be their own personal benefit. All right, well, Jay, before we let you go, um, guys, we, we dropped a new ad today um, in Texas. Uh, it's about Governor Greg Abbott. So back in October, Greg Abbott, uh, under enormous pressure from a guy named Don Huffines, who is as right-wing a wacko as there is, 
um, pulled down information regarding an LGBTQ suicide hotline from the state from the governor's website. Um, this week, or excuse me, late last week, he set up a new hotline for folks who are opposed to employee mandated vaccination to call and complain about their their bosses or their employers. Um, and so we just wanted to make sure that Texans understood uh, the dichotomy of this and just remind them that Greg Abbott does not care about Texans, does not care about Texans lives or Texas youth. Uh, he cares only about winning a third term. So B, why don't we go ahead and roll that? Until recently, the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services website provided resources for LGBTQ youth who may be struggling, even directing those who may need it to a suicide prevention hotline. But after Governor Abbott's primary opponent accused him of advocating for transgender ideology, the website was shut down. To make it easier for himself, What's the address of your Governor Abbott made it harder for Texas youth. In Governor Abbott's Texas, the only help he'll support may be after. It's too late. So, Jay, just one thing before we go, and I know, guys, we've kept you a couple extra minutes. When it comes to language, the idea, and this is just my personal opinion, I think our group's organization, uh, our group's opinion, that the Republican Party calls itself the party of life uh, is the height of devastating and fatal irony. Um, they only care about life so far as it helps them, and every other life is expendable to them. And I think that we're seeing more and more of this every day. Uh, guys, if you know of anybody uh, who is having trouble, you know, we we had we just listed those resources, um, but please reach out if you have any trouble. Also, if you go to our Twitter page, uh, we we listed the resources, how you can help folks uh, in Kentucky who are in India, or excuse me, in Illinois and Arkansas, who are the victims of these terrible tornadoes over the weekend. Uh, Jay, I want to thank you for joining me again. I hope you'll come back and see us, uh, you know, sometime next year. I hope you have a great uh, Christmas and holiday season. Everybody out there, um, thanks for joining me. Uh, you'll have a couple, you'll have a special show on Friday. I will not be here, but it should be entertaining and informative and probably frightening. With that, I hope everybody has a great week. Jay, thanks for coming. B, thanks as always. And gang, we'll see you next time. Right.